Um, biomimicry is um, what we do on Monday morning um, in innovation labs. And it's, uh, it's literally a problem solving uh, methodology looking to the natural world for models for new ways of growing food, building buildings, um, harnessing solar energy, purifying water. Um, it's, it's not um, growing algae. It's not actually using organisms. So there's a, there's a differentiation. It's a, this is actually um, borrowing nature's ideas. So what I'll do to explain this, since it's new to many people, is to give you some examples um, where biomimicry is bringing some innovative solutions to climate change. Um, the largest energy system on the planet um, is not coal or, or nuclear or fossil fuels, it's photosynthesis. And there's an enormous body of work going on decades now um, in what's called artificial photosynthesis, in which we basically are looking at how a leaf works. Um, and surprisingly, the, the, the photovoltaics that we know of, um, that you, most of you know of now, do not work like photosynthesis. They're not, um, photosynthesis works with actually a dye, with chlorophyll, with a pigment. Um, there now are solar cells based on, it's called the grid cell cell, or the disensitized solar cell, which is based on photosynthesis. Um, the other work that's really promising, I think, in the photosynthesis realm is uh, looking at, because what a leaf does is it, it doesn't really take sunlight and turn it into electricity. It takes sunlight and turns it into fuel. In fact, out of every 100 photons, 97 of them are turned into fuel. So the photon to fuel idea is really, is really I think, where the research is going to be very powerful. Um, the, the holy grail is, is a, a solar cell that would do what a leaf does, which is split water, perhaps to bubble off hydrogen, um, or a solar cell that would um, split water and would then go on to uh, create some sort of a, a long-lasting fuel, some sort of an energy storage um, in fuel. And work is going on throughout the world on this. It's a phenomenal horse race to watch. I've been watching it since 1990. Um, but right now, the disensitized solar cells are the ones that, um, you know, that, are, that are out there now that you can buy. Um, Another area is CO2, sequestration, and it's not forest. I'm not talking about forest or biomass or, or putting it into the ground, but rather if you ask nature what to do with CO2, the rest of the natural world besides us, don't, they don't see it as a poison. They see it as a building block. So some really interesting work is going on with CO2 as a feedstock for building materials and for plastics. Um, so it's just another thing to do with CO2. So there's a company right now that's got an investment from um, Vinod Kosla. It's called Calera, and it's, uh, it's for Brent Constance um, is, is the scientist and CEO, and he is a coral reef expert. He's taken the recipe from coral reefs, and he's taking CO2 and using it as a, feed, as a feedstock, CO2 plus seawater, to create concrete. Now, and, and, and cement, you know, the cement is a part of concrete that causes, it's literally concrete, which is the largest building material in the world, causes six to eight percent of CO2 emissions. And the reason is because in the way we manufacture it, we actually release CO2 because we heat it up so much. What the Calera process does, based on the coral reef, which makes a cement-like reef, um, it takes CO2 and sequesters it within the concrete. Same thing's happening with um, companies that are taking CO2 out of smokestacks using a recipe that comes from mollusks and they're, put it, they're creating powdered limestone. So you can imagine someday a, a concrete factory, a cement factory, that its raw material is limestone, but instead of mining the limestone, which is the bodies of old seas, seashells, um, you actually create it by bubbling CO3, 
CO2 through seawater to get powdered limestone. So it's these sorts of things. This is an innovation path that um, it's not biotechnology. <laughs> it's nature-inspired innovation. Um, energy efficiency, obviously life's uh, drag reduction capabilities are enormous. So in, in transportation, for instance, in, the, in the, um, the bullet train now, if you travel in Japan, the bullet train is not a bullet shape. The front of it is now a kingfisher beak shape. Literally a small diving bird that goes after fish and dives into the water without a splash inspired an energy efficient front for the bullet train that reduces energy use by 15%. Um, car manufacturers, plane manufacturers, there's a wind turbine manufacturer called Whale Power that is mimicking, believe it or not, the whale, humpback whale's flipper which has scallops on the leading edge that reduce drag by 32% when put onto airplane wing models. I mean, that's an enormous savings. So interesting research pipeline, um, interesting use of all the biological research that we've been gathering for decades to help us now take the three trillion in stimulus money around the world and make sure we don't lock it into high carbon technologies, but rather really radical technologies. Um, another one that's going to be uh, extremely important, I think, is looking at uh, swarm technology, which is the study of social insects like ants and bees, um, and the algorithms of efficiency, foraging uh, capability of these organisms, extremely efficient based on very simple algorithms that are now being used in, to help the smart grid, to help, to help appliances talk to each other. Um, countless examples of, of this. Um, and I'll talk later about, about how we might be able to actually ramp, get, get the, the research that's sitting in the lab right now and um, help commercialize it even more. <laughs>